Revelation chapter number 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, she just sang about him, a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, uh, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, uh, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, uh, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, uh, saying with a loud voice, uh, Worthy is the Lamb uh, that was slain uh, to receive power and riches uh, and wisdom and strength uh, and honor and glory and blessing, uh, and every creature uh, which is in heaven uh, and on the earth uh, and under the earth uh, and such as in the sea uh, and all that are in, in them uh, heard I saying blessing uh, and honor uh, and glory uh, and power uh, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne uh, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Uh, and the four beasts uh, said amen. Uh, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth uh, forever and ever. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your holy name uh, that you're not in the grave today. Uh, Lord, you're on your throne. Uh, God, we're thankful you are the true and only God. Uh, you're the omniscient God. Uh, you're the omnipresent God. Uh, you're the omnipotent God. Uh, you alone are self-sufficient. Uh, God, you're the one that took nothing and made everything. Uh, you're the one that went to Calvary uh, and shed your blood uh, for sinners such as I uh, that we might get born again. Uh, you're the one that preserved your word uh, that we might have a copy of it today uh, and read these truths uh, and glean from them uh, that we might go to a lost and dying world uh, and tell them Jesus saves. Uh, Jesus saves. Uh, Father, I pray uh, you'd continue to arrange the atmosphere this morning. Uh, help us to realize uh, what a privilege it is to come to the house of God. Uh, what a privilege it is to name the name of Christ. Uh, what a privilege it is to be born again. Uh, what a privilege it is to be able to call on your holy name. Uh, God, too many times we take these things for granted. Now, Father, help us today. You know our down sitting, our uprising. You know the number of the hairs on our heads. Uh, Lord, you knew when we were conceived in the womb. 
God, you've known uh, our yesterdays. You know our todays. You even know our tomorrows. Uh, you certainly know our wicked and vile hearts. Uh, so, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd do a work in our hearts. Uh, you'd touch hearts. Uh, you'd meet every need of every heart. Uh, and certainly save those that might be lost. Uh, help those that are struggling. Uh, revive the saints of God. Uh, use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. A lot of people are afraid of the book of Revelation because of truths that are hard to understand. Can I say they are hard to understand because we are finite and the one who pinned them down are, is infinite. God's ways are mysterious to our ways. God who lives where there is no time... Uh, tells us to be ready for our time is always ready. And so there's a lot of things in the book of Revelation that we scratch our heads about and we wonder and ponder. But can I say in chapter number 4, we find it talking about uh, John the Revelator who was on the Isle of Patmos, exiled, left to die, and God blessed him because he was the disciple whom Jesus loved to be caught up in the third heaven uh, and see things which are yet to happen uh, and pin them down for us that we might know some insights to what's about to happen. In chapter 4, He's shown a window and a door in heaven and then is open. He, he, he sees a trumpet is blown and he sees the saints of God going to heaven. Can I say that's the next prophetical event in prophecy in Scripture? And can I say that could happen today? And then in chapter 5, he begins to tell some things he sees going on in glory. So let's look at some things. Now listen, there are so many truths in this chapter, we could, we could preach them in a month of Sundays. But I want to give you some highlights to get to where we want to get to today. I want you to notice, first of all, the written and sealed book in verse number 1. The Bible says, John says, the revelator says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, the Father, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. He goes on to say that mm, this book, no man could even look thereon. No man could open this book. This book is a book of books. Can I say something about this sealed book? As you read the book of Revelation, you find out a little bit more about it. This book reveals the wrath of God. If we had time, we look in chapter number 6 and chapter number 7. Chapter 6, six of the seals are broken. Chapter 7, another seal is broken. And what happens is God pours out His wrath uh, upon this old wicked world. Uh, uh, there'll be pestilences and famines, uh, and there'll be all kinds of terrible things that befalls this earth uh, for those who've rejected God. Can I say this book will also reveal the woe that comes upon the inhabitants of this earth? Can I say, just this week, another hurricane hit down there around Louisiana. Can I say there are wildfires burning in California? Can I say there are earthquakes in diverse places? Can I say there are volcanoes about to erupt? And all those things are terrible things. But when God's wrath becomes a woe to every individual... They'll look for rocks to fall upon them to hide themselves from him and his wrath. Can I say this book also uh, reveals a wound to the devil? You see, while chapter 5 is happening in heaven, the sorry no good devil's having his way on the earth. And can I say when this book... The seals are broken, and God begins to pour out His wrath. It wounds the devil and what he's doing on earth. So we see there is a written but sealed book. I want you to notice as well there's a weeping servant. Look again at verse number 3. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon, and I wept much 
because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And we find this is John the Revelator. When he hears about this book that is so amazing that no man can look on it, and he hears that there's no man who can open it, the Bible says that he wept much. The reason John is weeping is the reason that a lot of us get all tore up when our trials come into our life. All John could see was the book. When your trial comes in your life, when your opposition, when your hardships come in your life, I'm not minimizing them. They're hardships for a reason. Uh, they're trials for a reason. They're testing for a reason. Uh, but if you're not careful, all you can see is your trial. What John doesn't see is the Lamb. And what you and I don't see is the Lamb. All we see is our problems. Uh, he is nearsighted. And we get nearsighted. His futility is showing out. He doesn't even realize where he's at. He's in glory. He doesn't realize that God's won through that old world out there on nothing and his command holds it in place. He doesn't realize God's in control. All he hears is no man can open the book and he's right. All he hears is no man can look on the book and he's right. No human man can even look on God and live. Mm, we see a weeping servant. But notice the worthy Savior. Look in verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Now get a hold of this. He's weeping. I'm going to tell you who the elders are here in a minute. But one of the elders says unto him, Weep not. Now get a hold of this, Miss Sidney. When you got born again, your name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your conversations recorded in heaven, your citizenship's in heaven, and John the Revelator's already seen you in heaven. Now think about it. 2,000 years ago, when he's caught up in the Spirit to the third world, he sees you. In the third heaven, he sees you. Now think about this. If you're born again, John's already seen you in heaven. Now this is just one of them foster theology thing. He said, an elder said unto him, weep not. Wouldn't it be wonderful if John in eternity future tells John in the past, weep not? Huh? Wouldn't that be something if John got to tell John, it's going to be okay? Huh? You know it would be good every now and then when you get tore up? If you would tell you, it's going to be okay. Hey, how many times has God come through for you? There's never been a time He's never forsaken you. He's never left you. Uh, how many prayers has He had to answer? Uh, how many midnight hours has He showed up? Uh, how many times has His grace flowed? Uh, how many times has He forgiven? Uh, how many times has He answered? Uh, how many times when there's been no ways made a way? Uh, so the next time your trial's in your face, uh, you need to get down in the gable in your soul. Oh, uh, not even wait for him. Uh, just say, he's never failed me yet. Uh, and so you ought to tell you, it'll be okay. Yeah. Said an elder, saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book uh, and to loose the seven seals thereof. Uh, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne uh, and of the four beasts uh, stood in the midst of the elder, and in the midst of the elder stood a lamb uh, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, uh, which are the seven spirits of God uh, sent forth uh, into all the earth. Uh, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Own. Uh, so he got his eyes on the lamb. Now, I don't have time to get in them seven eyes, seven horns, seven seven. I just tell you this uh, it's his omniscience, uh, it's his omnipotence, uh, it's his omnipresence. That's what all 
such things represent. Uh, he's the lamb that had been slain, hallelujah, some 2,000 years ago. The lion became a lamb uh, and was slain on the cross of Calvary uh, that you and I get to go to heaven one day. Amen. We see the worthy Savior. Can I say this? He alone is because of His omnipotence. He has all power. Yeah, he was slain. He laid down his, li his life, but he took it back up three days and three nights later. Uh, can I say this? He's not only worthy because of his omnipotence, he's worthy because of his offering. He gave himself and shed his own blood for your sins and my sins. Can I say he's the worthy Savior because uh, of his obligation to judge sin? All judgment's been committed to Christ. And he's going to judge this old world of sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Amen. I'm glad it didn't stop there. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We find he's the worthy Savior. Oh, there's the written but sealed book. There's the weeping servant. There's the worthy Savior. But I also find some worshiping subjects. Look at verse 8. And when he had taken the book... The four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Let me just stop right there. There's never been a time when you've truly prayed. I'm not talking about these now I lay me down to sleep prayers, and I'm not talking about vain repetition. I'm talking about when you open up your heart to God in prayer that heaven doesn't record that prayer. The Bible says they become odors. They're put in vials. They're odors. Uh, your prayers become uh, something that is precious to the nostrils of Almighty God. Uh, he said in verse number 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book uh, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us unto God uh, by uh, thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Uh, thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, uh, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh, and I beheld, uh, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was uh, ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands and thousands. Thousands, uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb uh, that was slain to receive power and riches uh, and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Uh, we find worshiping subjects. Can I say they worship in submission? There's nobody here going up to the Lamb saying, Why don't you give me the book? They're all bowing in His presence. The Bible says that God resisted the, the proud but giveth grace to the humble. Can I say this? They're not only in submission, they're in song. And we find in verse number 9, it says they sing a new song. Verse number 8, they bow before him. Verse number 9, they sing a new song. They're worshiping in songs. Say, preacher, why do we sing songs? They're a form of worship. Not all songs. Only songs that sing about him. Hmm? They're singing a new song. You say, what are they singing? What are they singing? Worthy is the Lamb. That's why we got on that banner back there. So I don't know that song. Well, hang around, neighbor. You go to heaven, you're going to sing it. Uh, they're in submission. They're worshiping in song, and they're worshiping with shouting. Look at verse 12. Look what it says. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. They're not saying... They're not going, hallelujah, glory. Say, so why does that nut in the back row act like that? He's getting practiced up. Do you realize this is the most quiet world you're ever going to be in? You see, in eternity, there's only two places. There's the lake of fire and there's uh, the abode of God. We call it heaven. Huh? But can I say this? Uh, 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 those in the, the lake of fire will scream in agony and pain and torments for all of eternity uh, because they did not let the Lamb pay for their sins. Uh, they chose to reject Him uh, and they're going to pay for their own sins uh, forevermore. Uh, but for that crowd that's going to glory, uh, hey, they're going to shout uh, and they're going to shout their lungs out. Uh, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Uh, 
I'm going to preach on this little thought out of this chapter on the subjects of heaven. We find the subjects worshiping here, but who are this? Who's this crowd? Uh, I want to preach on the subjects of heaven. Can I say in heaven there will be the protectors? Look with me in verse number 6. The Bible says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the, what's it say? Four beasts. Hmm. This isn't beauty in the beast. But before the throne of God, there's four beasts. Now you've got to understand, there are things in the book of Revelation that John is asked to write about, but John don't understand them. So he's putting down the best way he knows how to describe it by the Holy Ghost. Can you understand? Just fathom this so I don't run a rabbit right here. John went from the Isle of Patmos, living his whole life around the Sea of Galilee in a wooden ship and living and seeing uh, everything made out of stone and sand. And then he's blessed to see the future. Can you imagine what John thought when he saw an ocean liner? Can you imagine what he thought when he saw an airplane? A sonic jet? Can you imagine what he saw or what, what went through his mind when he saw combat by today's standards with nuclear bombs and planes flying over, dropping bombs and machine guns. I mean, they, back then they fought with spears, swords. And he's seeing all of this, and then to see some of the plagues, some of the plagues that he sees, I believe God let him see them through a microscope. And have you ever seen a germ through a microscope? It looks pretty, pretty wild. And he's trying to describe this beast coming out of the earth. He describes it as a locust because he don't know what else to call it. Now get a hold of this. He's seeing things. Well, he's looking at these four elders before the throne, and he calls them beasts. Hmm? Oh. Look with me in verse 8. I'm going somewhere. Hmm? And when he had taken the book, the four beasts. Now look with me in chapter 4. Look at verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like the crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast uh, was like a flying eagle. And uh, the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, uh, and they were full of eyes within, uh, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is uh, and is to come. All right. So what are the four beasts? Well, listen, what are they? You don't know, do you? You've never been to heaven, Psalm. Lucas, you're saved. You say all the time, I'm glad I'm saved. What's in four beasts? I know your dad looks like a beast, but we're not talking about him. And we found out Wednesday night who the real beast of that family is. Say, I don't know, preacher. Well, you're in good company. I have 27 sets of commentaries. Hardback, book. I have another 30 sets on my iPad. It's amazing what commentators would tell you them beasts are. Hmm? Some of them said they're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Apostle Paul. Uh, I don't think the Apostle Paul had six wings and all them sets of eyes. And, uh, well, since it's not there, I'm going to show you them in a minute. So what are the four beasts? Hmm? I'm going to tell you what the four beasts are. They're protectors before the throne. Now, see, at my house, I have a beast. He's about this big. But he's the biggest dog in the neighborhood.
neighborhood if you ask him. You don't want to come on our property. You don't want to walk in front of our property. He is going to rip the door off the hinges trying to get to you because that's his, his yard. And he's protecting mama. And he's going to protect mama at all cost because he's a protector. He don't realize he only weighs about 15 pounds. See, he likes Swiss rolls too. <laughs> These four beasts before the throne are there to guard the throne. You don't have a beast out there if you don't expect that beast to protect everything around you. So what are the four beasts? Well, can I say one of the beasts represents the seraphim. You'll find the seraphim in Isaiah 6. It's the only place mentioned in Scripture where they're called seraphim. And it's amazing, those seraphim had six wings. And those seraphim fly above the throne of God, and all they do is cry, Holy, 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 just like chapter 4 tells us. They are there to guard the throne and proclaim that the one sitting on the throne is holy. They're seraphim. Can I say, another beast are cherubim. You'll find them first mentioned in Genesis 3.24. When Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God sent cherubim there to guard the entrance of the Garden of Eden so they could not uh, uh, get back into the garden. Uh, can I say, on the, uh, the veil of the temple were two cherubim. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, over the Ark of the Covenant, uh, uh, there were two cherubim uh, uh, to be cast. Uh, cherubim always represents... Uh, the presence uh, but unapproachability to God. Uh, you won't get to God uh, unless God summons you. Uh, uh, friend, nobody's going to uh, uh, kick the doors open to heaven and walk in and sit down on the throne. Uh, uh, that's God's domain. Uh, hey, uh, and nobody gets there unless He calls them there. Uh, and we get to go by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, but anybody else... Uh, got to deal with them cherubim. Uh, uh, those are the ones who have flaming swords and nobody's going to get to God uh, through them. I believe God sent some of them cherubim uh, down and one night slew 100,000 of the Syrian army. They didn't even break a sweat. Mm, they're protectors of the throne. Well, there's two more beasts. Who are they? Well, you see, in God's domain through Scripture, we're taught about the cherubim and the seraphim. But there's another class of angels that are far above anybody else in Scripture. They're called archangels. Who's the other two? One of them's name's Gabriel. You'll find Gabriel mentioned in Luke chapter number 1. He's the one who comes and tells Mary that she's been chosen among all the women to bear the Son of God. You see, these angels... Uh, they not only ministers and proclaim things, but they're pretty tough dudes. How do you know that? Because the other archangel mentioned is Michael. You'll find him in Jude, and he's wrestling and contending with the devil about the body of Moses. Uh, 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 what's happening? Uh, uh, he is staying the wrath of Satan away from one of God's youngins. So who are the four beasts? Seraphim, Cherubim, Michael, and Gabriel. Hmm? Mark that down. You'll not read that in the commentary. Say, where'd you get that, Holy Ghost? You're welcome. Hmm? We see the four beasts are subjects in heaven. Who else is in heaven? There's the protectors, but there's also the pillars. Look what the Bible says in verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. We find several mentions to these elders in this chapter alone. There's four and twenty, or in other words, twenty-four elders. Who are they? Well, they're comprised of two classes. There's the twelve patriarchs, the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Each one of them is one of the pillars of heaven. They're the Old Testament pillars. God's chosen people were the Jews. The nation of Israel came through those twelve tribes. But then there are the twelve apostles. They're the pillars of the New Testament. They each have a special throne in heaven. They each are representative in the gates of pearl. 
uh, uh, can I say, in the pillars of the city of New Jerusalem. Their names are recorded there. Uh, can I say, in the Old Testament, the breastplate of the high priest uh, uh, had 12 stones representing those 12 tribes. Uh, uh, we know uh, uh, the impact the 12 apostles made in the church age. That's how I know the four beasts weren't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the Apostle Paul because they're one of the elders. That's why it might have been John who told John, weep not, because he's one of the elders. Are you listening? So we have the protectors. We have the pillars. Can I say there are the pages? What is a page? In Congress, all those congressmen, all those senators, they have pages. They have these people who run errands, who are messengers for them, who take a, a, a inter, a, 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 a Congress mail from one congressman to another. Do you realize that underneath the city, uh, running between the Capitol, between the Senate uh, and, and the congressman, do you realize there's a subway? And you realize you only have access to that unless your congressman allows you to go? Uh, uh, and can I say that's how to get around in D.C. without having to mess with the traffic or Black Lives Matter or whoever else is protesting this week? They all go underground. And uh, 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 Congressman uh, uh, Rand Paul might not want to pick up the phone and talk to Nancy Pelosi, but he might want to send her, you know, Senator Paul might want to send uh, Nutjob Pelosi a letter, and so he might have his page run it to her to make sure she gets it. Because I don't trust email, and I don't trust Twitter, and I don't trust Facebook, and I don't trust cell phones. I don't trust... Here, Paige, take this. Hmm? They're messengers. Can I say something? Who are those pages? Well, look at verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many... What's that word? Angels round about the throne. Can I say... The Bible makes it clear that when Jesus hung on Calvary, he could have called for a legion of angels to come and get him off the cross. Can I say in heaven there are legions and legions and thousands and thousands of angels. There are God's uh, 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 handiwork to dispatch and do whatever he wants. Can I say angels are messengers of God. They are ministers of God. They are maintainers for God. Uh, they maintain whatever He wants maintained. That's what their job is, to do whatever He says. Can I say a third of them, when Satan fell, went with Satan. That's a lot of them imps that you have to deal with. You see them usually Friday night down at the mall. Some of them weird-looking characters down there, huh? But can I say, it ought to amaze you, but the psalmist makes it clear that God has given angels charge over us. Now, the writer of Hebrews lets us know we were created a little lower than the angels. But angels are watching over you, Brian. When you crank up that big electric glide, head down the street, and there, there's a drunk coming down the road, an angel may just put it on your mind to take a different route that day because he's looking out for your welfare. Hmm? You see, you're in the Father's hand. You know, you're in Jesus' hand. You're engraved in his hand. His hand's in the Father's hand. You're in the Father's hand. You can't get out of the Father's hand. You're secure forevermore. He has you and your salvation secure, but your flesh isn't. And sometimes the devil's got a bullseye on you. And then God will send an angel to distract you to get out of the bullseye. Hmm? You see, there are angels around the throne. See, an angel's different than an archangel or a cherubim or a seraphim. He's just a page. That's all he is. He just dispatches, does whatever God tells him to go do. If one of them four beasts get involved, somebody's getting hurt. Angels get involved. They're there to minister, to help, to strengthen. Huh? You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood? God dispatched angels to minister unto him. Hmm? Now, you know why. The Bible made it clear, everyone that hangeth on a, on a tree is cursed. We know that from numbers, when Moses put a poison serpent on a pole and said, look to live, we knew Jesus was dying on a cross. But see, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he began to hemorrhage, 
and he sweat his work, great drops of blood. I believe every imp of hell was dispatched there and tried to kill him in the garden. See, if he'd have died in the garden, he wouldn't have fulfilled the promises of the Scripture, and he couldn't have been our Savior. So God sent angels to minister unto him. When he was praying, let this cup pass from me, he wasn't praying that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. He came to the world to go to the cross. He was praying for strength to make it to the cross. My dear friends, angels were dispatched. Pages were sent. God knew exactly which angels were sent down there to help the Son of God. The fourth and final subject you find in heaven are the pardoned. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, look what, look what it says in verse number 9. And they sung a new song, hallelujah, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. Now look at this next terminology. And hath redeemed us to God by thy blood. Can I say something? He didn't redeem the beast. He didn't redeem the angels. He didn't die for them. Hmm? And then it says, out of every kindred hmm? and tongue and people and nation. Can I say the four and twenty elders? They were all the same tongue and kindred. They were all Jews. Hmm? They weren't out of every kindred, every tongue, every nation. And he said, verse 11, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. Uh, 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 and it's a colon, you see that? So we have the pardoned, we have the beast, we have the elders, we have the angels. They're around the throne. Now, that calling stops that thought. The next thought goes back to those that he redeemed. Look what it says. And uh, the number of them, who? The redeemed, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands uh, saying with a loud voice uh, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing who's saying that the redeemed uh, hey uh, that crowd that he died for uh, that crowd that he shed his blood for uh, that crowd that he saved uh, that's the crowd who's saying that uh, now think about that those that have been pardoned out of every kindred, tongue, and nation. That ought to cause you to have a hissy fit. Just think about right here in our congregation today. We got Native American Indian right there. Hmm? You see, if he wouldn't have shed his blood for every kindred, there'd been no hope for you. We got St. Lucian back there. Uh, he gets to go to heaven. Because Jesus tasted death for him. We got Miss Filipino right here. Huh? She gets to go to heaven. Because he shed his blood for her. We got hillbillies in here. We got Irish people in here. We got the German people in here. Huh? We got people from every nation, tongue and kindred just about in here. Huh? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means he was slain for you and I uh, that we could go to heaven. What a blessing. Uh, and if you've been born again, you're going to be in that number that day crying, worthy is the Lamb. We'll witness him opening the seals. We'll see him uh, be the lamb and the lion combined. He'll be our lamb, but he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And my whole question is really this. Are you going to be there? Hmm? So I go to church. Oh, what a blessing. I'm talking about are you going to heaven? Have you ever been born again? Have you ever realized you were lost? That you needed to be saved by the grace of God? So, preacher, I've been baptized. Wonderful, but if you haven't been saved, you're just a wet sinner. Baptism won't take you to heaven. And you know what takes you to heaven? The blood of Jesus Christ being applied to your life. See, when you realize you're lost, you're guilty. And the only means for your help is a pardon from the one who paid for your sins. Uh, 
He paid for your sins in his own blood. That's why he went to the cross. Uh, that's why he was buried and rose again to prove he was the Son of God. He took your shame, your sin, and nailed it to the cross. Uh, then he took your death uh, so you could have eternal life. Uh, and he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, have you ever seen yourself lost uh, and realized you needed to be saved uh, and called out for mercy unto God? remember I said a minute ago nobody gets to the throne unless God calls them Jesus said and I if I be lifted up will draw all men unto me Jesus said nobody, no man cometh unto the Father except he be drawn has there ever been a point in your life where you realize whatever you was trusting in wasn't right and you felt like you needed the Lord you needed to be born again. You needed to be saved. What is that? That's the Spirit of God drawing you to the Father. Showing you what you've trusted in isn't the right way. The only way is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When he's talking in Sunday school class, you can go to any region of the world. Find people that have never heard the gospel, but they're worshiping something. Because God made man out of the dust of the earth and God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. The very conscience of man knows there's a God. Romans chapter 1 tells us you can look at all that he's created and you're without excuse not to believe there's a God. But there's one thing in believing in God. It's another thing to believe on God. To believe on the Lord simply means you realize you can't save yourself. Religion can't save you. Baptism can't save you. You can't do enough works, enough good deeds to save you. All of your deeds are as filthy rags, the Bible says. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. See, sin came in this world by one man. And death by sin. But I got good news. Life came by one man. His name's Jesus. And he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered your sin. And he freely invites you to come and put your faith and trust in him alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if I could do something to get to heaven, then I could brag. I'm here because of what I did. But see, the only one who can get to heaven has got to go through the Lamb. My dear friends, the beast around the throne will prohibit you from going to heaven unless the blood's been applied to your life. So I ask you again, are you going to be there? So there's a lot of things about Revelation that people conjecture what they mean. They think they'll know what they mean. and all. It don't matter what you know and what you don't know. And what matters is who you know. Do you know him? Are you going to be there? Can you go back in your mind right now to a place where you realized you was lost and you was guilty before God and you called upon God for mercy and he saved you? The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. When old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Can you go back to a place where you met the Master? Now listen. Some 31 and a half years ago, this darling lady right here became my bride. I can tell you just about everything about that night. I can tell you about how mean and nasty I was the night before. It almost didn't come to pass. I was just being me. You know what I'm saying? I can tell you just about everything about that night. I can tell you about that night. I can tell you about the night each of my three children were born. Sydney was born the day, but the boys were born at night. I guess that's why she's prettier now. I could even go back farther than that. I could take you all the way back to when I was nine years old. We was playing in a big tournament against a team that was a whole lot better than us. We was down two to nothing. It's getting late in the game. I'm in the on-deck circle. Remember service merchandise? You used to have one on Mall Road, huh? Well, I'd been to service merchandise and been to service merchandise, been to service merchandise, been to service merchandise, and been to service merchandise. 
And in service of merchandise, I had a glass case, and they had a pocket watch that was calling my name. I drooled all over that thing. I'm in the on-deck circle. My mama hollers from the stands. Bases are loaded. I'm up. She says, if you get a double, you get the pocket watch. Triple. <laughs> Scored. We won four to two. Now, you can ask her. I just got it out this, this, this week. Got it out. Why? It still works. Hmm? Huh? It's almost 50 years old. Still got it. Hmm? I also got the baseball with the black mark from the black uh, uh, aluminum bat that I used that I got to hit with. Hmm? I can remember that. I can remember getting married. I can remember the birth of my children. If I can remember all those things, but I can't remember the night that Jesus saved me and changed my life, something's wrong. I can take you back to the third Saturday night of March of 1974 when I met the Master. How about you? Can you go back to a place? You met Jesus, and He changed your life for now and all eternity. Brother Doug wrote that book, From Time and Eternity. Got it in my office. He changed my life that night for now and for all of eternity. And I know my name's there. I know... I'll be in that number in Revelation chapter 5 shout my lungs out worthy is the Lamb. How about you? You know that? The preacher, I, I'm just not sure. You can't be sure. You can get it settled right now. We're going to have an invitation. Invite you to come. If you'll come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible show you what the Word of God says so that you know that you're putting your faith in Him and Him alone. I'm not asking you to become a Baptist or anything else. I'm asking you to become a Christian. Huh? You can have your sins washed by the blood of the Lamb. Friend, you can get saved today. So, preacher, I've been raised in church. I've heard you preach a thousand times. Listen, I'd heard my granddaddy preach for ten and a half years, but it became real. I was the one that needed to be saved. i got news for you. You can be saved today. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He shed his blood just for you. So you could be saved. He don't want you to die and go to hell. He wants you to be here. It's His will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to be there. Has John already saw you there? If not, I'd come get it settled today. Friend, just come give your heart and life to Jesus. It'll be the best day of your life, I promise you. And then in the future, we'll be around that throne. You'll look over and say, Preacher, I'm glad I'm here. And I'll look and say, I'm glad I'm here too. And we'll worship the Lamb. How about it today? You going to be there? I wouldn't leave here without knowing. I'm going to be there that day. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. While they're coming, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for Bible truths. Lord, I can't wait to sing that new song because you're worthy of all adoration, all laud and honor and praise, because you tasted death for us. Lord, you came to where we were and convicted us of sin, showed us we were lost so we could be found. We could be saved by the good grace of God, rescued from our sin. You broke the power of hell and the chains of sin in our life. God saved us and changed us. You're worthy of all our admiration. Lord, you're worthy of everything that we have. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Lord, if there's anybody here today that won't be in that number, Lord, I pray today the sweet Holy Ghost of God would show them that. I pray they'd come and give their heart and life to Jesus today. Make provisions. You've already paid the fare. They've just got to come and get on board. And so, God, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Speak to hearts now. Help folks to do business with God. Maybe somebody here is saved. Lord, but they've just taken for granted the goodness of God. I pray, God, you'd break their hearts. God, maybe somebody's here today and they're saved and they've just been living like hell. 
God, I pray they'd be right with God today. God, there may be somebody here today that thinks they're saved or they're trying to talk themselves into being saved, but they really can't go back to a place. I pray today would be the day that salvation becomes real to them, that they quit playing games, but they get right with God. God, I pray if there's somebody here saved in the center of God's will, but they've just been struggling, I pray that they'd see the Lamb high and lifted up today. God, get glory to your name. We'll bless you and praise you for it. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.